I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my shop, aka the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to build a couple built in cabinets with raised panel doors, some floating shelves with LED lighting, and a fireplace mantle. So stick around and see how I get it done. Shop Apprentice and I agree that the wide belt sander is the coolest tool in the boardroom. Over the years, I've picked up a few tips on how to deal with raw materials, both hardwood and plywood. First, when I order my materials, I ask that the plywood goes in first and the hardwood goes in second. And when unloading the hardwood, I like to stack similar sized boards together. And second, unload your plywood onto some sort of a cart with wheels. And if you don't have a full size truck or van, get yourself a circular saw and cut down your sheet goods in the parking lot of wherever you purchase the materials. For cabinet projects, I use a design software called eCabinets, and it helps me produce drawings as well as this here, which is called a nest diagram. And this is really just a roadmap to help me break down the sheet goods as efficiently as possible. That's the Boulder Turnpike above downtown Denver during morning commute. Let's take a closer look at my sliding table saw. This saw is equipped with a scoring blade, that's the smaller saw blade in front of the main saw blade, and it is designed to cut the bottom of a panel before the main saw blade comes through and cuts it, and this creates a real clean cut top and bottom. And a sliding table saw is very much like a regular table saw, except it has this carriage attached to the side of it that slides forwards and backwards. And the main benefit of this carriage is that it is very easy to break down 4x8 sheets of plywood. One of the things I like most about this saw is that the fence has two flip stops. And this is really nice because I can cut a piece to both length and width by just lifting or lowering the appropriate flip stop. With all the panels cut out, it's time to do some edge banding. And for this project, I have chosen to use fast cap speed tape and PVC edge banding. And fast cap speed tape is really just double sided tape that's designed for the application of edge banding. And I chose to use PVC edge banding because I had a roll of it laying around, and it's a little more durable than the iron-on melamine edge banding. So I think one of the coolest things about this method is it really doesn't require too many tools. You just need an end trimmer, a J roller that I'm using here, and a side trimmer, and a mill file, and you can really get some excellent results. And these end tremors work great, just about perfect results every single time. These side tremors, on the other hand, work really well on PVC or melamine edge banding, but if you're using real wood edge banding, sometimes they can cause a little tear out. And next I like to break the sharp corner with a mill file. And if you just kind of move the file side to side, it creates more of a slicing cut. And this leaves a nice smooth edge. And the final step is just to clean off any extra adhesive with some denatured alcohol. Pretty nice results if I do say so myself. And next I move on to drilling shelf pin holes. This is known as a line boring machine. It drills 23 five millimeter holes in each pass. The holes are drilled at 32 millimeter centers and as you can imagine, this makes quick work of shelf pin holes. Next, I move on to assembling the cabinet boxes and I start with some staples and I finish off by screwing all the parts together. I use inch and three quarter screws to hold the cabinet together and I make sure to use the appropriate size counter sinker. All right, here's the game. You get one pinch to pull out the right amount of screws for whatever it is that you're putting together. And of course, I didn't get the right amount. I missed by two. I'm horrible at this game. And here I'm just cranking out a toe kick. So during this build, I heard the song Land of Confusion by Genesis, which is a great song. But then later the same day, I heard the same song covered by the band Disturbed, and I thought they did a pretty good job. Time for a coffee break. So I thought I'd ask you, the viewer, what are your favorite cover songs where the original and the covered version are both very good? Let me know your picks in the comments section below. All right, and here I'm just adding some strips of plywood that eventually the left and right fillers will be attached to. 
and I'm setting these back from the front edge, the thickness of the plywood. And next I summon the mighty lamello biscuit joiner from the cave that it lives in. And by cave, I just mean the drawer I keep it in. And I drill a series of biscuit slots in a second piece of plywood. And then I staple this second piece onto the original. One neat feature of this biscuit joiner is the cutter can be adjusted up and down very accurately and repeatably. So I adjust the cutter down by half a millimeter and I proceed to drill some biscuit slots in the fillers. And by adjusting the cutter down slightly, it actually allows the filler to overlap the edge of the cabinet just a tiny bit. And this ensures that there's not an ugly gap between the edge of the cabinet and the filler. And this is one area where biscuits really shine because there's a little up and down play. And I use this play during installation to get the filler exactly where I want it. And lastly, I put an edge detail on the fillers, and this is the same edge detail that I'm going to put on the edge of the doors. And one last detail I'd like to point out, I cut the fillers to the same height as the doors, and I think this looks real nice when the fillers and the doors line up perfectly. All right, next I make the countertops, and this is just a single sheet of three-quarter ply, and I attach an inch and a half wide solid lipping, and of course biscuits and glue, best way to get that done. And I also add some three quarter inch strips to the bottom of this sheet of plywood, just so the whole countertop is an inch and a half thick. So switching gears back to the topic of awesome cover songs, Bob Seger has a song called Turn the Page and Metallica covered that song, both versions awesome. And now it's time to make a really cool, modern, and sleek fireplace mantle. This mantle really is just a bunch of bevel joints glued together. And anytime you're gonna cut long bevels on the table saw, a power feeder really makes this easy. The two challenges when cutting long bevels on the table saw are consistent feed rate to avoid burning, and also consistent downward pressure. And the power feeder takes care of both of these nicely. I don't know if you can tell or not, but this piece is slightly warped and even still I get really nice bevels because right at the point where the saw blade is cutting is nice consistent downward pressure. Oh hey, look at that, I'm wearing my safety glasses finally. And the ends of the long pieces are cut on the sliding table saw. And this operation is just one of a thousand little tricks you can do with a sliding table saw. It makes life real easy. After all the parts are beveled properly, I tape the bevels together with good old fashioned blue painter's tape. And I used to do this with one long piece of tape and now I like to use chunks of tape because it gives a little window just to make sure you can see that that bevel is coming together and gluing up nicely. I'd like to take just a second to talk about wood movement. As you may or may not know, one of the first rules of woodworking is you never glue wood together where the grain is perpendicular. And specifically what I'm talking about is the short end piece versus the two longer pieces you see standing vertically here. So right about now, I imagine you are asking yourself what in fornication is going on. I can see that in this glue up there is grain that's perpendicular to each other. And the simple answer is the cross grain section of this is only gonna be six inches total. And that's just not really enough to cause wood movement problems over the life of this mantle. Now in no way am I giving any sort of permission to go ahead and glue up your projects with cross grain orientation. This is just one of those things, I've done this enough times over the years and I know that Type Bond 3, which is what I'm using here, has enough stretch in it to accommodate slight amounts of wood movement. The first one of these I built was in the late 90s. I've probably built 50 or more since and I haven't had one split open on me yet, so hopefully that's enough proof. So I let the glue dry overnight. The next day I come back, it's time to pull the clamps off and remove all the tape. After all the tape's pulled off, I hit it with the random orbit sander and it's ready for staining. Not too bad. Next I move on to building the floating shelves. 
So I get started by cutting a groove with my biscuit joiner. This is one of my favorite tricks. One of the cool things about this trick is in the mating piece, there's no measuring or marking where the biscuit slots will be cut. You just kind of cut them at random and they're sure to have a home in this slot. One of the most common questions I get is, what biscuit joiner are you using? So as you can see here, it's the Lamello Top 20. And what sets this biscuit joiner apart is the cutter can be moved up and down in the opening as I showed earlier. And the adjustment knob has detents at one-tenth of a millimeter increments, so it's very accurate. So after cutting the grooves in the shelves, I work on the front face piece. And as you can see, I just cut a whole bunch of biscuit slots. And I have offset the bottom biscuits to accommodate the LED tape light that I'm going to be installing shortly. And here I'm just cutting a rebate to house the LED tape light I'm going to install. And I prefer to cut a rebate versus a rabbit unless the rabbit has it coming. All right, let's take a closer look at this LED tape light. This stuff comes in different intensities. Uh, I buy it by like the 15 or 20 foot roll, and um, it's typically measured by watts per foot. And in this case, I'm using a 1.5 watt per foot tape. And this stuff is pretty cool. You can cut it at either inch or inch and a half increments, and it's all 12 volt, just plugs into a regular outlet, and then it's stepped down to 12 volts from there. So it's real safe and easy to work with. And as a quick side note, I'm just showing this cover here. I actually didn't install it in the finished product because it does reduce the amount of light output by a fair amount. So here's a detailed shot of how the front edge of the shelf covers up the LED lights. And here's a quick shot of how the whole shelf goes together. You can see I have some cleats that attach to the wall. The cleats hold the bottom of the shelf with pocket screws, the top goes on with nails, and the front is glued on with biscuits. Next it's time to move on to making the raised panel doors. Check out those sophisticated plans. I like to cut my parts a few days ahead of time and let them sit like this to allow them to acclimate to their new size. Anytime you're cutting smaller parts out of a larger board, most of the wood movement that's going to occur is going to happen within the first couple of days after cutting it up into the smaller pieces. That's the reason I like to let my parts sit around for a couple days before doing my final milling. If you have this space in your shop, a dedicated chop saw station with a flip stop can be a really useful tool. And the last step in the milling process is to rip all the parts to final width. So for this particular project, the customer requested that I match the door style of their kitchen as close as possible. And it just so happens that this set from Freud matched pretty darn close. Overall, I think these router bit sets are very good. One thing I don't like is that they're not calibrated from the factory, so you have to sit there and adjust all the shims until the fit is just right between the three bits. Here's a quick pro tip. I like to use a ruler touching the bearing of the router bit and scooch the fence forward slowly until the fence and the bearing are in plane. I don't always do it this way, but typically I prefer to do the cope cut first. A little while back, I built this router table and I put a build video up on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in how I built this router table, go to my channel and have a look. It's titled Very Good Router Table. And after using this router table on a couple of projects, I can assure you it is a very good router table. I set up the stick cutter by having one of the edges of the teeth touch the top of that tongue. This is a 1 8 horsepower power feeder. I believe they're affectionately nicknamed a baby power feeder. They're perfect for router tables. They have a nice and low slow speed, which is good because it leaves a really nice final surface and it won't uh, bog down your router motor. Now it's time to raise both the roof and some door panels. And I decided to not use the power feeder just to show that you can get great results by feeding parts through by hand. 
And if at this point you're wondering why I used MDF for the center panel, it's for two reasons. One, it paints better than solid wood, and two, it is more stable than solid wood. However, I don't think MDF is as strong as solid wood, so I decided to make the frame out of solid poplar. After glue up, I let the doors dry for a day, and then it was time to take them over to the wide belt sander. So this sander uses a belt that is 75 inches long and 43 inches wide. Runs on a 20 horsepower motor, I think it weighs about 2400 pounds. And it's not a particularly high-end model, but it works really well, and for my needs I'm very lucky to have it. I bought it off a shop that was going out of business in Utah, and I drove 10 hours each way to buy this thing. And fortunately the guy selling it had a forklift, and also my neighbor has a forklift. So loading and unloading it was actually pretty easy. One of the coolest things about this wide belt sander is the fact that the belt oscillates back and forth. And this is achieved through two pneumatic rams that are triggered by electronic eyes. So as the belt gets to one side, a ram pushes it back to the other and vice versa. And this makes the scratch pattern much softer and less visible. So I use this sander to flatten doors, face frames, veneers, glue ups, and all kinds of other things. Really useful tool. Here I'm just squaring up the doors. I make them uh, maybe a sixteenth oversize and I'm just doing skim cut on all four sides to make sure the door is nice and square. Same edge treatment goes on the doors as went on the fillers. And the final operation performed on the doors is drilling the hinge cups. And these inserta hinges are great. They clip in and out really easily, so you can clip them in, mock everything up, and you can clip them out and do your final sanding and paint. All right, now let's take a look at how all of this goes together. I start by pressing the fillers in place, and then I move on to clicking the doors in place. Once the doors are in place, I think the cabinet really comes alive. You can see here how the filler and the doors are set at the same height, and the gap between the door and the filler is set at about one eighth of an inch, and it's nice and even. And here's a pro tip bordering on trade secret. Make the doors 1 16th of an inch thinner than your fillers so that the faces line up perfectly when a small gap is left for hinge clearance. And here's an embarrassing pro tip, I like to use an old sock to apply stain. I find that being able to use my whole hand allows me to apply a nice even coat. And you can see the white paint in the background drying, having to switch between two types of finishes really slows things down. After the stain is dry, I apply a few layers of a satin clear coat. While the finish was drying, I made some cutouts in the back edge of the adjustable shelves, and this allows wires to be run easily from shelf to shelf. Next, I add a small chamfer to the outside edge of the shelf, and this will cut off any chip out and also makes it nice on your hands for delivery. After everything was nice and dry for a few days, I loaded up and headed over to the job site. And the blue tape is actually there for design purposes. I did the layout in blue tape to help the customer envision what the final product will look like. And I get started by marking some level lines for the cleats that get attached first. And then I mark the location of the studs. And this stud finder is just a magnet. It finds the head of the steel screw or nail used to hang the drywall. Next, I mark and pre-drill the cleats with a generous pilot hole. And when selecting a screw length, I like to do the calculation so that the screw doesn't penetrate into the stud more than one inch. And if the house was built to code, you'll have no problems running into plumbing or electrical if your screw only penetrates the stud one inch. And please note that I said if the house was built to code. And because the shelves are only about 12 and a half inches deep, I was unable to get the side cleats attached to a stud. So I hold the cleat in place, I drill through the cleat and into the drywall. This marks the location for one of the screw in type drywall anchors I like to use. And I was able to get a screw into a stud in the back corner. 
Once the cleats are in place, I move on to fitting the lower portion of each of the shelves. And I do this by measuring front, middle, and back. I check the widths. I also use a square to see how far out of square each corner is. And I transfer all this onto the piece and I cut it with either a track saw or a jigsaw. And this lower piece is attached with pocket screws. Next I cut the tops and I just have those sitting there and then I drill a hole and this hole is going to be where I run the wire for the LED lights. Once the wire's been run down to where the switch will be, I proceed to stick the tape light in place. Here's a few close-ups of the finished product, and this is a pretty slick way of putting lights in cabinetry or shelves. So the lights are pretty cool, the dimmer works good, but the real item of note in this shot is look at the shine on that guy's head. That couldn't possibly be my head, right? All right, enough comedy jokes. Back to work. And here's where all that biscuiting earlier pays off. I just simply cut this piece to length, I put some biscuits and glue on, I tape the front edge in place, and that's all that's needed to hold this together. No nail holes to fill, and a nice sleek look. All right, now that all the shelves have been put together, it's time to hang the fireplace mantle. So, after eating french fries for lunch, I hang this french cleat on the wall with a few screws. So the mantle slips right on and hooks in place, and I just use about four nails to hold this in place permanently. Next, it's time to install the lower cabinets. I start by marking and cutting the baseboards, and I do this to make clearance for the baseboard that I'm going to install. After that, I level and set the toe kick. And if I take my time and do this right, I don't even need to check the cabinet for level because I know it's sitting on a perfectly level surface. Once the cabinet is set in place, I mark the locations of a couple of studs and I screw the cabinet to the wall. And when attaching the cabinet to the wall, I make sure not to pull it out of level. If there is a small gap behind the cabinet and as you tighten the screw down, it pinches the cabinet towards the wall, I like to put a couple shims behind the cabinet to hold it in place. And next I install the baseboard and I just do that with construction adhesive again so there's no nail holes to fill. And in this particular case, on one side there's baseboards and on the other side there's stonework, so I have to slide the baseboard down in from the top. And then I reinstall this little piece of the original baseboard, and it kind of helps clamp the baseboard that's attached to the front of the cabinet in place. And next I move on to installing the left and right side fillers, and as you can see I made them intentionally wide. I measure in a few places, then I mark and scribe and cut them to fit. Glue and biscuits to hold everything in place, and a nice friction fit between the cabinet and the wall holds everything until the glue dries. Once the fillers are installed, I cut and fit the countertops the same way that I did the shelves. And after that, I click the doors in place, and I adjust them until the gaps are nice and even. And once the doors are adjusted, I install the knobs and I clean up any of the wiring and cover plates and things like that inside the cabinets. Then it's time to clean up and take some finished photos. So overall, I'm pretty pleased with how this project turned out. I think with the space given, this is a pretty nice fit. I also like the look of the white paint versus the dark stain. I think it creates a nice contrast. I also like the LED lights. I think they make the installation more elegant, and the near-invisible install is slick as snot. Lastly, I know this video covered a lot of ground. If you have any questions about any of the processes that I did in this video, please feel free to ask your question in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Till next time.